back to Dallas Darts Organization International. My guest today is a real asset to our community, both because he had a front and center seat to some very important events in the late 20th, early 21st century in the Taoist and uh, Qigong community, and also because he has the academic background <clears throat> to properly frame these events and um, report on what he saw and learned in a way that is uh, accurate and accessible for the rest of us. David Alexander Palmer is my guest. He is a professor of anthropology at Chinese uh, Hong Kong University, and he's author of several works. Uh, chief amongst them, at least for this discussion, are uh, Qigong Fever and Dream Trippers. Uh, Dream Trippers is a book about how Western seekers, uh, particularly in the uh, spiritual traditions of Taoism, have taken different approaches to Taoism. Uh, what they found when they were amongst the first people in the 20th century to go to China after China opened back up, um, you know, what they found in the Taoist traditions, how they interpret them, and the reaction both to their teaching methods in the West and, and the reaction that Chinese people at that time had to their teaching uh, approaches. Uh, Qigong Fever is a book about the actual origins of Qigong in the 20th and 21st century, and uh, they're both uh, excellent books that I highly recommend. I would even go so far as to call them must-reads, um, particularly Qigong Fever. Um, if you've been studying Qigong for a while or you're thinking about getting into it, this is a book that you need to read to understand what Qigong in this day and age is and where it comes from. Um, so in addition to these books, uh, Professor Palmer is also part of a team uh, that is involved in a research project called the Yao Dao Project. And this is a project that is studying and uh, recording the traditions of the Yao people, who are a people who traditionally have lived in the Chinese highlands and the highlands uh, borderlands around Laos and Vietnam. And they're widely believed to have a maybe the best preserved Taoist religious tradition that goes all the way back to the beginning of the celestial masters tradition, which was the beginning of uh, sort of where Taoism uh, changed in some ways uh, to become a philosophy into a religion. So he's involved in that project. We talked about the books. We talked about the project. And we at Dowie are also hoping that we can get back together with Professor Palmer and his colleagues at the Yao Dao Project to do a interview specifically on that subject. So if you like this interview, please, by all means, um, like, subscribe, share the interview, and leave us your comments and let us know what you think, um, because we would really like to drum up interest in the subject and um, have this entire Yao Dao project team on uh, for an interview. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Thanks. All right, Professor David A. Palmer. Professor Palmer, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Could you maybe get started by explaining to our audience uh, who you are and what it is that you do, what your profession is? So, right, my name is uh, David Palmer. I'm an anthropologist, uh, and I teach in the University of Hong Kong. Um, and um, as an anthropologist, I've done um, a lot of studies on the Qigong movement and on Taoism in contemporary China, um, and also on the spread of Taoism to uh, the West. Uh, so I guess we're going to talk about that in my book, Qigong, uh, my book, Qigong Fever, but also my book, uh, Dream Trippers, which talks about that. And I also, um, beyond Taoism, um, I've done a lot of research and written about the transformations of religion in China in general uh, in the modern period, including all different religious traditions, and generally about the sociology of uh, Chinese society. And now, actually, I've been doing some uh, new research on the religious dimension of global China. Um, as China now has more and more influence around the world, how does that interact with the different religious realities of different countries around the world? That's fascinating. Is there anything in your pre-academic life that hinted at what you would be doing now? <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, so the the way it all started, in a sense, um, in relation to Taoism, uh, is uh, actually the co-author of uh, the Dream Trippers book, Elijah Siegler, um, is my, he was my um, junior high school classmate, and we oh. were very good friends in, uh, uh, in high school, and um, 
So both he and I had a, um, an affinity with the Tao Te Ching. I, um, my father had it around, lying around in the house, and I was reading it, and he was really into it too. And um, so we actually had some common interests at that time in, in Taoism and also in the Yi Jing. We were actually, we were both um, in the high school debating team of our high school in Toronto. And um, we... Um, We actually, we really loved having fun at impromptu debating tournaments. And at one debating tournament, we actually, you know, the, the topic was just given to us and we had to defend a certain position and we cast coins right on the spot in public in front of the audience to get our arguments uh, by using the Yi Jing. We opened up the book and we, uh, there was the argument. <laughs> Wow. so, uh, <laughs> um So, um, yeah, you know, so actually early on, uh, the interest in um, um, Taoism and also things Chinese, I went to a high school that, um, which was in downtown Toronto, Jarvis Collegiate, which uh, had maybe about 30% of Chinese and Vietnamese, and actually the Vietnamese were mostly Chinese Vietnamese. So the school was just full of people speaking Chinese and this culture was all around me. And so I was curious to learn more. Was there anything specific about that culture that resonated with you uh, as, as compared to the culture that you were born into? Did it make more sense to you in a certain way or... Well, oh, that's actually a really good question, because at that time, I didn't really know much about Chinese culture. That, uh, But, um, you know, first the food, obviously. <laughs> um, but there was something else. Um, the um, which at that time, because I was um, actually I was kind of pretty nerdy and um, uh, more academically oriented and. Um, You know, I think among the Asians, the East Asians, they really appreciate that. And so if you're Yeah. kind of introverted and, you know, um, that kind of, right, kind of academically Yeah. oriented, uh, that was, uh, that I, I just felt kind of I didn't really fit in very well among my peers of my, um, you know, the general kind of uh, North American kind of, you know, in that kind of culture because I wasn't a jock or that kind of stuff. Um, but for the East Asians, you know, so I had some very good friends who were uh, Chinese or Korean, and somehow I had a lot of affinities with them. And they were more philosophically oriented and more thoughtful and more quiet. And I kind of had affinities with that. So that was maybe something that also attracted me in the culture. Yeah. I can understand that. So let's jump forward quite a bit, I would guess, to Qigong Fever. And this is a Uh book, -huh. um, I, I really think that everybody that studies Qigong uh, needs to read this book because especially in the West, um, amongst everyday practitioners, casual practitioners, there's not a very good understanding of the term Qigong, for one thing. Uh, where it actually comes from and what modern Qigong is compared to, say, something like, uh, you know, Dao Yin or, you know, uh, Yang Shen Gong practices, even though they're very similar, there's a there's a long period of history there that, that changed some things. Could you talk a little bit about what your um, what your goal was in writing the book or what the impetus was for for beginning the book? So actually, it was kind of, um, as it was not, um, I mean, I didn't just have this, this idea, hey, I'm going to write a book on, uh, on Qigong in China. Um, but the book came out of my PhD dissertation. And the way that I kind of stumbled onto that topic uh, for my PhD was that, um, So basically, I had done my undergraduate studies uh, at McGill in Montreal uh, in anthropology and East Asian studies. And I wanted to, because I had studied, um, I mean, my focus had been mostly on anthropology and um, anthropology focuses on understanding different cultures and the kind of the logic of different cultures and how they're structured and how they shape your way of thinking and being and things. And I, um, uh, that's always been very, very interesting to me. But there was something that I found was a bit missing was looking at the inner side, the inner dimension, the more psychological dimension or the more spiritual dimension of uh, other cultures. And so I had, um, after uh, graduating, I, um, 
I kind of, to be honest, reluctantly decided to go to China. Um, I had studied Chinese and I hadn't enjoyed studying the language, but I just decided to go to China just to get <laughs> to get it out of my system. <laughs> yeah. But it, it turned out that it went deeper and deeper into my system as a result of that. Um, but anyway, so I ended up going to China as an English teacher in 1993. And I did have in mind that I wanted to... Um, eventually uh, end up doing graduate school and, and, you know, do a PhD. And so, although I went as an English teacher, I was kind of also thinking about, you know, what might be some possible topics or, or, or issues or phenomena that I, that I might have as a, as a PhD dissertation topic. And um, just before going to China, I had spent a few months in Paris and I met up with a professor with whom I wanted to study in the future. His name is Toby Nathan. He was he was the founder of a French school of um, ethno, what is called ethnopsychiatry or ethnopsychoanalysis. So basically, the application of a of um, cycle it kind of it can also be called cross cultural psychology. Um, and so it was. Um, it is really about understanding the different forms of psychology that exist or psychology and psychotherapy that exist in different indigenous cultures. And so I told him uh, I was going to China. And then after my trip to China, I'd uh, like to study with him. And he said, OK, when you go to China, uh, become the student of a traditional healer and then come back and see. And, you know, and then we can talk about doing a Ph.D. So I went to China kind of, you know, um, kind of with that question in mind. And um, it was actually only within a few days of my arrival in China at this school where I was a teacher at a cadre's college for um, for the petroleum industry of, of China uh, in Sichuan. Uh, you know, there, there were people practicing Qigong all over the place. Uh, they were practicing right under, right at outside the stairwell of uh, my flat, these old ladies every morning doing something that they called xianggong, like somehow perfumes were coming out. I didn't smell anything, but they were, uh, <laughs> they were happy in their, in their um, fragrances <laughs> that was coming out of their exercises. And um, even some of my students, they were, my students were engineers and some of them were practicing. And, and even one of them was even a qigong master himself. So he, he brought me into his practice group. He took me to a a session where there was kind of a charismatic Qigong healer who 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 uh, he gave a lecture and people started falling into trance and things like that. All of this within a week of my arrival in China. Wow. <laughs> so this was like, wow, there's something going on here. Um, and um, it, it's actually now when I think about it, because now the whole idea of qi is something that is very familiar to me. I mean, not only conceptually, but like viscerally. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But uh, at that time, it was completely new. And once I became exposed to uh, the experience of qi and everything, just like so many others in China at the time, it was kind of a, a transformative experience. So you have the whole country was like getting into these kinds of practices and experiences. And so it was just booming all over the place. So it was a craze or what people called a fever. Right. Uh, so I thought, well, this is just something that needs to be studied. Um, it's both a form of traditional healing, but it's being, but it's also the form is just very modern. Uh, you know, the Qigong masters, they were wearing polyesters, you know, business suits with cheap, you know, tacky ties and, you know, just pretending to be so modern, even like hologram pendants. It was all just very like this, this, this kind of urge to, to present Qigong as something really, really modern. Right. Um, whereas it was, but it came from something very traditional. So there were all these really interesting issues that I wanted to uh, explore. So I ended up doing my whole PhD study um, on it. Although in the end, because that uh, professor, Toby Nathan, he's, his expertise is more in Africa, not on China. So I didn't do my PhD with him. So I did it more, I did it with Christopher Shipper in the field of Taoist studies. So that got me into uh, understanding better also how Qigong fits into the, the history of Taoism. Yeah. That's fascinating. You know, I was really interested in what you were talking about. It's sort of um, indigenous traditions of um, psychiatry, you know, because I, when I started reading about Nadan, there were so many things and I thought this is like Jungian psychology. It, it's mm -hmm. almost, it's almost like a, you know, you're instead of going to someone, you know, to, to 
for, for psychoanalysis or for, you know, psychiatric care, it's sort of like a self-care type thing. And I think Qigong has that element too. It's physical, mm -hmm. but it also works on an emotional level. Um, did your personal experiences in any way, was it difficult for you to study this while you were actually a part of, uh, in a way, a part of the movement because you were practicing Qigong? Was it hard for you to be objective? So it, it was actually very difficult to handle for a number of reasons. First of all, um, uh, I had a problem with the actual, um, um, the whole milieu of, the, of everything that was going on with Qigong in China at the time. Um, um, because it was all, um, I mean, it was anthropologically really, really interesting, but it was yeah. also, it was just so, um, um, it, 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 I could say it was just all so tacky, <laughs> as I yeah. mentioned before. You know, be, the, because these were people who had just emerged from the Cultural Revolution and they were just discovering so many things from for the first time, including some of their ancient traditions, but also certain forms of modernity. So it was kind of like a cheap sci-fi movie yeah. the whole qigong movement and it was it was like a b film really the yeah. whole thing was like a b film and so when you read qigong fever the book you kind of get that sense yeah. but actually to be in it was funny sometimes but actually I, I i just got so sick of hearing people telling me about all the miracles that could be attributed to qigong and all the paranormal phenomena and all the scientific experiments that proved it all and you know they were just going on and on and on and on about this kind of thing uh, and Qigong masters who just wanted to make a lot of money. So it was it was actually um, uh, it, it, the the whole experience at the time of engaging with the the world of Qigong. It's not one that I actually really um, loved. Mm -hmm. That was one thing. And then um, on the other hand, in myself, the practice of Qigong is very powerful. So yeah. I did. Um, there was a point where um, I was just getting so deeply. Um, um, in, uh, engrossed in my meditations um, that, and I wrote, and I actually wrote to Elijah um, about some visions that I was getting, and he gave me a reality check. You know, he said, okay, David, come back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I realized that I actually need to stop if I want to write this thesis. Right. Yeah. Um because I was just entering states that are not states that you could actually write a, a coherent, rational narrative. Um, <laughs> so, so I stopped. Um, uh, and, and that was good, actually. Um, because the mental state of writing a PhD is maybe not the best kind of healthy mental state. So it's maybe not the best one for practicing Chico. <laughs> right. Yeah, I can see that. But actually, over time, after, you know, the whole mm -hmm. the whole PhD passed and and other things, actually, I've come back to it. And so now uh, that working with Chi and everything like that is totally an integral part of my body and who I am, I'd say. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, same here. But I do understand what you're saying. And, and it's fascinating when you read the book to see how gripped the populace was by the practice of Qigong to the point where, you know, initially there were all these government sanctioned scientific experiments and labs and things like that. And, you know, just a, a lot of chicanery going on that, that, that these scientific organizations were just trying to think their way around because mm -hmm. Qigong was so popular that they, you know, they wanted to prove it rather than disprove it. And then there was sort of a backlash, but people were so into it that the government almost just sort of like let it go, you know, in, in a certain sense. There were still some avenues where they they could say you can study these. What, how how is it termed? Um, ex extraordinary powers, I think it, it, right. it was a term that they used. And right. and to, to watch just the the popular movement of it become so powerful, of course, and then you know, kind of culminated in the, the Falun Gong, uh, you know, the rise of Falun Gong and then the, 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 the ultimate backlash from the government. Right. 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 Were right. you in China for that entire period, like until 1999 when, when sort of that started? Yes, I was. And actually, um, it was interesting because I could, uh, I was there during the whole period, uh, most of the time, basically the second half of the 1990s, I was, 
kind of spending my dividing my time between Paris, where I was doing my PhD, and Chengdu, where I was doing my research, collecting materials, and writing uh, my thesis. And um, so I saw the the that um, in a sense the peak of the Qigong movement um, and the kind of problems that were starting to arise with various controversies and just a lot of the outlandish claims just being debunked and, and things like that. And then the rise of Falun Gong. And what was interesting was that I saw Falun Gong um, uh, at the beginning. Uh, you know, for me, it was just one of so many different Qigong groups, and I wasn't paying that much attention to it. Um, and I was writing my thesis and um, and then, but I saw there were more and more and more and more of them. Um, and then I saw um, the, the, where there were practice groups actually outside the where I lived in Chengdu and their banners and things. And, and then I realized that it's actually a bit different from other Qigong groups in this, in the very, very explicit, we, I would say uh, like religious yeah. uh, and even sectarian um, kind of uh, ways of, um, of uh, conceptualizing things. And um, uh, and actually, then I remember telling one of my best Chinese friends, uh, this was in uh, spring of 1999, I was writing my thesis and I told him, uh, there was actually a lot of very interesting kind of parallels between the Qigong movement and some of these millenarian movements that have existed in Chinese history. Um, uh, because they were also involved in meditation and practices that we might be called that we might now call qigong and things like that, um, and even some of these end of uh, utopian or um, right millenarian kind of views of the future. But I told him, but there's one thing that I haven't really seen in qigong is any uh, there hasn't been an uprising to challenge the government, mm -hmm. um, and that was the that was like February 1999. And then two months later, then there was this Falun Gong, literally, um, you know, uh, there was this mass uh, sit in or meditation in around the um, Zhongnanhai, the, the headquarters of the Communist Party of China, which was perceived by the Communist Party and, and really by anybody in China. This was really seen as a, ch a challenge to the, the authority of the party. And so it was like, oh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, th uh, that kind of a group, um, a group has gotten bigger, and then it has challenged uh, the the political authority. And then, interestingly, that friend whom I had, I had told him that in February 1999, he was actually intrigued by Falun Gong as a result of our conversation. He had been very much into Taoism, Qigong, and things like that. Um, so he actually looked into Falun Gong. And then he came to me uh, a month later, uh, zealously um, like a convert uh, to Falun Gong and wow. that actually everything I had told him and that I was going to write would lead to the perdition of so many people because they would not appreciate, it. they would kind of be, um, they wouldn't see the truth about Falun Gong in what I was writing. And so he tried to convert to convert me to Falun Gong and to, uh, so it was, in, it was interesting how quickly he, he, there was this transformation in him. And then uh, weeks later, there was that big incident uh, at Zhongnanhai. Um, so I was there during the whole thing and I had collected a lot of documents and that friend of mine, after Falun Gong was banned, he gave me a whole box full of materials because everybody then was asked to hand over all their Falun Gong materials and and they were all burned or they were all shredded and everything like that. But I had the whole trove of stuff. Um, so with that and other materials, I wrote the only real account uh, of Falun Gong prior to its suppression in 1999 um, and how it fits into the whole story of the Qigong movement. Um, and even though my account was not it was only one chapter, one or two chapters of my book. It's still the most detailed account that exists anywhere. And every other book on it um, refers to mine or just practically lifts lifts it completely and re just rephrases what I have written because nobody else was there doing that research. And most of that material now has disappeared. Yeah, yeah. that was fortuitous um, that, that you were there. Um, yeah, it it really um, it really was. I, I, it was. You know, I thought when I when I did this research that this Qigong movement would just go on and on forever. 
um i didn't realize it would hit this kind of climax and or anti-climax or whatever and then that the whole movement will, would be shut down in china um although interestingly it is now coming back um but you know for a, but that story just ended and a lot of the materials that i used for the whole qigong fever book all these pulp magazines on qigong you know i thought they would be published indefinitely uh and i was lucky that i got complete collections of all those uh, you know qigong magazines and everything cuz they stopped being published and and those materials were uh they would be very very hard to find nowadays yeah yeah at the time outside of falun gong were there other practitioners that were maybe more traditional practitioners that tried to um, distance themselves from the movement or was it more or less universally popular regardless of pe whether people belong to it or not other qigong practitioners actually no falun gong was um uh well, first of all, I think most people didn't really see the difference between all these different groups. But um, uh, in terms of the masters of different groups, so there were thousands of different Qigong masters. Um, most of them had a very different approach. Um, basically, that most of them didn't, they, uh, because of controversies around Qigong, around these kind of claims of paranormal power, and, and all of that and so that led to a backlash from the scientific community in 1995 and and so then there were controversies and that led to the government to start to try to uh, control the qigong movement to some degree and i think most of the qigong masters they didn't really they tried to um, just um, keep a lower profile when the climate just became a little less favorable um so their approach wasn't to challenge um but just to keep a low profile right um but falun gong was very much you know you criticized me i'm going to organize a sit-in so any newspaper that criticized falun gong the next day they'd have thousands of practitioners uh, right out there so they that they were really pushing things in a pretty a confrontational way and the other groups, not, none of the other groups took that kind of an approach. Um, uh, they just tried to, um, and, you know, without taking con confrontational approach, you could get away with a lot. So the other groups were just going ahead, going, doing what they had always been doing. Um, they just weren't trumpeting themselves maybe as loudly, but that was it. Otherwise they were just there in the parks and doing what they'd always been doing. Um, so Falun Gong had a very different approach and Falun Gong really was also very critical of the other Qigong groups, uh, criticizing them for being corrupt, for being materialist, um, for, um, uh, right, for being ego, egocentric. So in a sense, the moral critique of a lot of the things that were going on in, in the Qigong movement, Falun Gong was very much, um, very much putting forth that critique and attracting a lot of Qigong uh, practitioners from other groups. So Falun Gong was growing very fast. Hey, I was shocked at the one one story in the book where it was a very small, I think, university publication that, that just ran one article criticizing Falun Gong. And like you said, the next day, they had basically surrounded the office and demanded that the publisher stop you know, publishing his uh, magazine or journal. Right. And so that's then what led to, um, uh, so this was uh, a scientist wrote a polemical argument against Falun Gong in a pretty obscure campus journal of Tianjin University. Um, and right, that thousands of Falun Gong practitioners came the next the next day demanding retraction. And um, some, um, okay, now I can't really remember the detail anymore and have to check in the book, but basically then they were told to go to Beijing if they weren't happy. And so literally they did. And so the next, that was about two days later, that's when thousands, uh, supposedly about 10,000 Falun Gong practitioners then had their sit in around the headquarters of the Communist Party um, and actually demanding again, the retraction and also the, res the lifting of any restrictions on Falun Gong and so on, yeah. One of the interesting things to me about the group is that after the government crack down and you know a lot of the followers left the country or the ones that some of the one some of the followers left the country the ones that could that was kind of the start of 
the popularization of Qigong in the West, or at least the United States. I, I became aware of Qigong, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. But sort of in the late 1990s, you started to see people here in the U.S., at least on college campuses, passing out Falun Gong flyers and things like that. And mm -hmm. it almost became a cause celebre in the way that Tibetan Buddhism was in the late 1980s and early 1990s. It always struck me as odd that there can be a, I'll just call it maybe a human rights or religious freedom situation or something like that. It doesn't, it sort of seems to fly under the radar in the West until it becomes associated with religion. In other mm -hmm. words, there, there could be an adversarial relationship between a group and a government in another country and people in the West maybe know about it, but not, not so much. But when it becomes a situation where it, that's perceived that the religious freedoms are being quashed all of a sudden it becomes kind of a kind of a cause in the west um do you have any insight on that at all do you think that that's a do you think that's a western thing or is it specifically an american thing yeah I mean, that's not american yet, but right yeah um it's that's an interesting observation um because i wasn't in the us at that time my impression actually was that Falun Gong um, was, so the, the Falun Gong issue, um, it got some traction, but actually not that much. Um, that was my impression. And partly because it was just conceived, it was just perceived as a little too weird, you know, compared to the, because there's a whole human rights um, network of human rights advocates and so on. And most of them are very secular people. Uh, and then, um, uh, and then, so, you know, when Falun Gong comes along, they even asked me, like some of these people based in the UN, you know, in New York, and like, who are these people? Like, they just couldn't wrap their heads around what this group was. Yeah. Although maybe, you know, the, the, but on the other hand, something that you're saying about religious issues is that also at the end, around the end of the 1990s, but more in the 2000s, the whole issue of um, religious freedom as an organized kind of cause, uh, where there are organizations defending religious freedom and so on, uh, have, has become more, um, more systematic. Um, so, and I think there's something at a core in the Western values, which is, you know, our, our conscience, our freedom of conscience. And so um, when pe people's deepest beliefs, so no matter how wacko they may seem to be for the outsider, but um, when people are seen as being persecuted for, you know, just for their beliefs, then I think that does, you know, that, that there will be definitely be sympathies, um, on a, you know, in, among Westerners. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So you mentioned that Qigong is starting to have a bit of a resurgence now. Um, is, is it common to see people practicing Qigong in public or is that still something that's not, that's frowned upon? So, yeah, so, I mean, it's not that there's a resurgence of Qigong per se, but similar things are uh, are resurging, but in different ways from, from the way it was in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, because basically what happened after the, um, the uh, suppression of Falun Gong is that, so Falun Gong was pretty, hard, you know, it was very harshly suppressed. Right. Um, so, but all the other groups they were softly suppressed. Mm -hmm. So, and the other groups didn't offer any resistance or almost all of them, maybe a few did, but most of the groups just folded, right? The The masters just, you know, they had come out of the mountains and yeah. started teaching publicly and then they just went back into the mountains, so to speak. Um, but also, also a lot of them emigrated to the West. So there's the connection that you you were mentioning Already in the 80s and 90s with the Qigong boom in China, you had some of them migrating to the West. But then by the late 90s, some of these masters started to feel the winds changing in China. So they started emigrating. 
And then after the early 2000s, others, in fact, I would say most of the major ones ended up leaving China. Uh, and some of them then ended up spreading their movements overseas, and some of them actually didn't. They just emigrated and then just um, kept a totally low profile. Um, so Qigong became a very sensitive term, and it's... It, it, you know, for so for many years after after that, whenever I would go to mainland China, I would never say that I that I had researched Qigong. Um, so you know, I I uh, so to talk about that I was researching Taoism, that's fine, um, or even religion in general, that was fine. But I would certainly not let it be known uh, that I uh, you know <laughs> that I was uh, that I had been doing research on Qigong. Um, but things gradually, I, because I think the issue, at one point, the Chinese government felt that it had um, successfully um, eradicated Falun Gong within China, and it and the issue kind of became less sensitive. So then there was a point where I was invited um, at a university to give a, a talk in 2007 on the Qigong movement, on my book, basically. Uh, and then there was more interest in that. Um, and then I saw that uh, the Qigong Research Institute of Shanghai was uh, operating. They invited me to give a talk. And what I saw was that it was still quite sensitive within China, but because there's a strong foreign interest in Qigong, so that kept it going in a sense. There was this kind of, in order to placate the foreign, um, for, you know, foreign friends, right? Uh, so they're coming to China to learn from our traditional Chinese culture. So the government was okay with promoting Qigong overseas, but not within China because of the association in the minds of the Chinese government between Qigong and uh, cults and things like that. Yeah. So that was, um, and I think that's probably to some degree the case. But Qigong has become so desensitized now that actually just it was just yet a few days ago that a major media outlet in Beijing, very, very um, uh, kind of um, like uh, government associated, wants to do an interview of me. And they were thinking of how, how to frame it. And they literally said, oh, how about on Qigong? And I'm like, what? You want, and this would be an interview in Chinese for a Chinese audience, not um, for an overseas audience. And like, wait a minute, isn't that way too sensitive? Uh, but, you know, but so I guess now they they were okay with it. But actually, what's been going on? Um, what we can see in in the overall Chinese society is um, a proliferation of um, overall New Age practices, um, a number of which are related to um, Qigong. But actually, it's just much bigger. So the body, mind, spirit, what is called the body, the Shen Xinning, body, mind, spirit movement. So all kinds of things, which include uh, not only Taoist derived practices and Qigong derived practices, but a lot of yoga um, and Indian derived practices, shamanistic healing, you name it, it exists in China and it's big. Uh, so this has been a new fever that's actually going on these days. So it's much more mixed now. Um, in the in the eighties and nineties, it was more of this indigenous thing coming from the Qigong tradition. And actually, to be honest, now those things are a little less popular because they have that association with kind of old 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 school kind of old people. Yeah. you know, lost in, whereas yoga and these things that, that actually they've, you know, they've circulated out of Asia and back into China, yeah. but now they've acquired a certain sophisticated veneer. Uh, it's much more, um, you know, yoga is much more popular and trendy in China than anything related to Qigong or martial arts or things like that. Like in terms of people actually practicing, um, and even other kinds of things like, um, you know, all these ancestral, um, uh, you know, various forms of tantras. Actually, Tibetan Buddhism is very popular, believe it or not, among Han Chinese people, um, all kinds of stuff. So things related to Qigong are in there, but also they are now really more and more in the under the label of Taoism. So you can go out and on the Chinese version of TikTok, um, you know, pre, you know, teach Taoist um, 
um, Baduan Jin is very popular now, the eight brocades and these practices and Taoist masters teaching all, all forms of Taoist self-cultivation and so on. That's increasingly popular. So it's less under the label of Qigong now. It's just more directly under the label of Taoism. Interesting. Yeah. That kind of ties into the entire globalization of, of religion and, and ties in nicely to, to moving on to talk about another great book that you wrote, Dream Trippers. Uh, global Taoism and the Predicament of Modern Spirituality. Uh, this book is something that I, that I also really highly recommend to people, especially if they're interested in Taoism or first becoming interested in Taoism. And uh, it's, it's a very readable book. Um, it, it's very entertaining, but it's also the type of book where if you are involved in Taoism or martial arts or have been for any period of time and you start reading this book, you're, you might see yourself in this book. And, and you, you may not like what you see, you know, the, the, you, you, you might be you know, reading it, reading it like this. Um, but could you maybe uh, for the audience, just just talk about the uh, the premise of the book or, or basically what the book is, is about? <clears throat> so basically, um, um, I mentioned earlier, my high school friend, Elijah Siegler, um, and so he, I had done my PhD uh, in Paris on the Qigong movement in China. And it turns out that he did his PhD at Harvard on Taoism in America. And actually American Taoists, a lot of what they do is, is Qigong. Yeah. So we, and we were doing our PhDs at kind of parallel times, uh, more or less at the same time. And so after I, uh, uh, in 2004, both of us had recently finished our PhDs and Elijah called me up and he said, hey, you know, one of the groups that I've been studying, you know, in my PhD, um, Michael Wynn's group, Healing Dao USA, they're organizing a, a, a so-called China dream trip to China. And I'm thinking of going to join them as, you know, just a, an extension of my study of American Taoism. And he said, so, hey, they're going to China. So why don't we do this together? Um, uh, why don't you also join? Because you're an expert on China. And so you can see how the Chinese Taoists would respond to these American Taoists. And um, we we actually originally just wanted to join one trip, you know, for a few weeks and then write a little article. And it wasn't, uh, that was it. But it turned out to be so interesting that it turned out, it, it became a whole book that took us 10 years to research and write. Uh, it was so fun. And basically what it's about ultimately is you've got um, Taoist uh, masters. Uh, they migrated to the, to America uh, in the 1960s and seventies. And so they started teaching uh, over there, but what they taught and how it ended up being, received and absorbed and digested, we could say, by uh, Americans and Westerners in, in general, is, is something that necessarily will be quite different from the way it was uh, in China. And so that's the process of the Westernization or the Americanization or indigenization of Taoism, we could say, in, in, uh, in America. So then what happens when they go back to China, these American Taoists, and they meet with monks in Chinese monasteries on Chinese sacred mountains. Uh, so how will, what will happen with two, um, will they recognize each other as having anything in common or will they just be on completely different planets? Um, so that's basically the question. Um, and it turned out to be a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. And the book, one of the things that, sort of caught me off guard or surprised me a pleasant surprise about the book was in the book you know you you have a seemingly two opposite groups or or, or i guess individuals you know you have um, michael Wynn, who is a head of this organization that kind of reminiscent of eastland institute type thing you know they're bringing in all kinds of different disciplines under the umbrella of Taoism and some various uh, almost like new age practices, I guess, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, you have Louis Kamiathi, who is uh, very interested in a traditional lineage based practice, um, you know, based on things like scripture and things of that nature. Um, and, and they're very different. 
you know, they have very different outlooks on, on what Taoism is and, and what they're trying to learn and teach. But what was interesting to me was the way that the Chinese Taoists interpreted and were influenced by the Americans' view of Taoism. Uh, you know, people even now have this idea that if they they go to the east and go on to some sacred mountain, that everything is going to be like it was, you know, 500 years ago or a thousand years ago, and it's going to be a legitimate practice and things like that. But in the book, you know, Louis Kamiyathi went to study with Chen Yuming and, and Chen ended up actually leaving the monastery because he was so tired of the politics and the commercialization and the tourists and things like that. Things that, you know, Americans in their minds or people in the West in general, I guess, in their minds go to, you know, China to escape all that, you know, sort of like a commercialization or, or, or noise. And it, it was interesting to me that he seemed to have this idea. I don't need this. I don't need this environment to teach what I want to teach. As a matter of fact, it's detrimental for me to teach what I teach. So I'm going to go ahead and move into the city and become an urban hermit. And, and that, that really kind of brought home to me that, it, it was already globalized at that point, in a sense, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a, as people from the West started going back into China, the, the Chinese were seeing how things had changed. And it, it made me realize that it's not that it's not it's not necessarily a, a, a corruption of, of the teachings. It's, it's more about, gosh, I'm having a hard time framing my question here. I, th I think of the case of not seeing the forest for the trees in, in, in a way. In other words, people tend to get so wrapped up in, in, in where the practice is being held that they, they miss the practice itself, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, yeah, so it turns out, on the one hand, that... Um, I mean, it's possible to look at the the encounter in a caricatural way, in a yeah. sense. You know, you have these kind of new age, kind of flaky, you know, Americans who don't know anything, you know, and they think they know everything, but they actually yeah. don't know. Uh, and then meeting up with these, you know, well grounded Taoists who are, you know, deeply immersed and within their tradition and their lineage and their sacred spot. And so they know, you know, they they are within the true and authentic context of the religion. And so, and in a sense, our book kind of does, that's the initial framing, right? But then we realize that it's not so simple. Right. Um, and that um, the, the question about the authenticity of the American Taoists, um, which is certainly one that, that people will ask themselves and that our key American protagonists are asking and trying to answer in their own way, whether it's Michael Wynn or Louis Comiati. But that question also exists in China too. Yeah. Uh, and it exists even among the monastics, those who are in the monastery, um, because the monastery is also in any country, it's a, um, it's a material sociopolitical organization. Yeah. Um, and in China, there are whole all layers of politics that affect it. But to be honest, in any 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 country, a large monastic institution which has a lot of resources, um, you know, that's in a famous mountain and things like that, it would have its own variety of kind of politics that could be seen as a distraction from uh, from a true spiritual path, and. Um, uh, now you add to that though what happened in China with all the the history of upheavals during various revolutions um, over the 20th century, and so really transmission that was um, that was broken um, in many places, so that the whole question of authenticity is as acute in China as it is in America. So then, really, what we see is a story of of both American and Chinese Taoists trying to find the root of the authenticity of their tradition and 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 sometimes um asserting their own chinese or american root of authenticity so either to say for example right we are rooted in our chinese lineage here in china and 
that's where we are. That's the true thing. But one could say on the other side, well, in America, we've freed ourselves from all that baggage. So actually, it's in America that we can actually build an authentic Taoism. Um, so we can see, so we see that, in a sense, those two possibilities, but we also see that we see American Taoists going to China, and actually seeking lineage, seeking uh, more depth, uh, um, trying to become more grounded in history and so on. So we do see that coming from Western Taoists going to China. And we also do see from some of the Chinese Taoists, this actually this attraction to that, we might say a naive um, kind of purity of uh, American Taoist practitioners who don't have all that, you know, there's a thousands of years of baggage of feudalism, of um, some of the dark side of Chinese culture that is has it also seeps deeply into Taoism because Taoism is almost the heart of Chinese culture. And so there's just something, you know, from a Chinese perspective, there can be just something so fresh about these Western, uh, you know, these Western uh, seekers after the Tao who just have none of that baggage. So, yeah, so I mean, that that's so interesting to see then that we have a story that's it's not a simplistic caricature. It's a story where there are differences. There is also a harmony and union, and there is also uh, exchanges and mutual learning going on with with you know people who have their strong characters and their idiosyncrasies. You know, Taoists. I think both in China or and in America, they have one thing in common. They're quite the you know <laughs> they're always interesting types, and they don't really fit in. You know, they can't fit into a mold very well. So they all have their characters. Um, um, so that said, um, I think there's something now also in retrospect, thinking about it like uh, years after conducting the study and um, uh, um, the, um, the book and everything. Um, I mean, on the one hand, now I would have because um, I think writing the book still at from the the from the the standpoint of a scholar who, um, you know, is grounded in the study of Chinese history and culture and everything like that. So in a sense, there's still a kind of a bias in the book toward the Chinese, um, you know, the Chinese let's say the true Tao is more the one that's rooted in China, right? right. Um, and our interlocutors noted that, right? Um, but um, now, and, although, and we were open though, we weren't, unlike um, Lewis, we were quite open to, you know, the Michael Wynn approach, you know, and we think, you know, but now I'd be just be totally 100% open to it. You know, I have no problems with it whatsoever, the, the American approach. But on the other hand, though, there's something that I would say is that, there also is something to be said about um, the unique um, quality or signature, we could say energetic signature quality of specific locations, right? So a yeah. mountain like Huashan, but also Qingchengshan. And actually, our, in a sense, our book is a bit, uh, it might give a slightly once um, distorted picture because uh, the situation in other mountains, such as Qingchengshan or, or Wudangshan, um, uh, the situation of the co condition of the monastic community, the relationships between the monastic community and foreign practitioners, the relationship between the monastic community and the government is actually very, very different from Huashan, uh, which is the focus in our book. In Huashan, it was a very tense relationship between the mountain and the government, um, and also a, um, a very um, uh, um, internal monastic relations, also not very healthy. And that led to somewhat um, distant relations between the organized monastic community and the foreign visitors, although there were individual friendships. Um, but we could see that in Wudangshan, it's quite the opposite. And so many, many um, Taoist uh, Western Taoist organizations have had longstanding relationships with Wudangshan. The, the energy field, we might say, is... Um, is different. Um, and Ching Chung Shan, uh, also there are more women, uh, let's say in some of the uh, mountains, it's a Ching Chung Shan, it's more of a, it's a female monastic community. 
And our book focused more on men because they were monks, right? And our protagonists, our chief protagonists are all men. So there's a lot of nu uh, nuances, but one thing is for sure, every place has its unique uh, energetic signature and its unique reality. And that can't be transplanted. And so as somebody who's practicing Taoism in the US um, or you know, working with Qi in the US, they're also doing so within that highly localized energetic field that they are located in, in the US. And that would lead to something different from what's happening in, in China. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I believe that's true. Um, what do you think about the notion, something that uh, Wynn talked about a little bit in the book that he said, maybe I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, maybe people will be attracted to what I do because of some sort of new agey aspect, but that will get them in the door to a deeper study. Um, is that... I know that that happens. I've seen it happen. But do you think that that's a rationalization for the commercialization of the of the religion? <laughs> I guess you have to ask Michael Wynn. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, um, I think that. Um, let me let let me take Michael out of it. Just just so not 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 to put you on the spot. I, right, I, right, right. A lot of people in the United States, whether it's uh, or in the West in general, I, let's just say in the West, whether it's martial arts or Qigong or Taoism, there's this notion that a lot of people have that if you're not reaching, pe if you want to help people and, and you want to help people help themselves, if you're not reaching them, then you're not going to be able to help them so that there has to be a certain element of commercialization or popularization to whatever it is that you're trying to teach in order to attract people. Is that something that you agree with? Do you think that that's something that I, I would say that you kind of are seeing that in modern China right now, like what you were talking about earlier with TikTok and things like that? Do, do you think that that's it's necessary for there to be a certain degree of, for lack of a better word, commercialization? Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question. And um it's interesting because Taoism, um, in general, as a tradition, is, I think that the, I guess the, the, uh, self-sacrifice for the 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 free dissemination of the of the Taoist teachings that's not really part of this tradition in the way that it might be in some other religions so for example actually I'm a Baha'i and in the Baha'i faith teaching the faith is something that one does without a it's something that that one sh that one should be that one should do naturally without a kind of proselytizing kind of pressure um, but enthusiastically, but also never to make money, right? One, right. Even though it takes time to, you know, we spend a lot of time in study circles and in all kinds of activities which are um, sharing the Baha'i teachings, but it's quite, uh, you know, it should, it's never ever in a commercial mode. So that's something in the Baha'i approach. And it's interesting that the Taoist approach is actually quite different, Um and Taoism doesn't, it has a very different, a very complex and very subtle relationship with money. And so I, I, so some people would say, oh, you know, they're offering courses and they're charging. And so they're making a business and it's a very entrepreneurial and, co and commercial thing. But I mean, I don't know, why not? I don't see, actually, I can't really see the problem, um, even from a Taoist perspective. The only thing is, um, there are different um, from a Taoist perspective. Okay, so I said I'm a Baha'i, but I'm also deeply kind of, <laughs> uh, you know, immersed in and uh, influenced by Taoist ways of thinking and, and so on. Um, I think from a Taoist perspective, there are um, there are different levels of um, of spiritual motivation, right? Um, and so. And it's totally natural that there are people at different at different um, at different levels. Right. 
And it's natural that there are some people who are more on an outward um, kind of uh, expansionist kind of um, approach or mode of being and uh, others who are more, um, you know, um, you know, in a more yin mode, right? And so some are more in a yang mode and others in a more in a yin mode. So they're not, they're happy to be all alone and never say anything to anybody. And that's totally fine from a Taoist perspective. Um, but then, you know, uh, uh, there's also, Taoism is also about channeling energies. So some people, that's what they do. They channel energies and they do so, they do so going outward. And then now, then there can be different ways of working that out. You know, the the materiality of it all, the fact that you need to make a living. You know, there are no strong religious institutions uh, in Taoism that collect resources uh, and then make it possible to offer a lot for free to people. So then, how do you do it? Right, you do it in a in a commercial way. And besides, these practices have tangible instrumental benefits to people, right. uh, health benefits and so on. So because Taoism always mixes the instrumental and the transcendental, um, so then you can also do these things in a more instrumental way, but you can also, so you could take either a position of that, com you know, commercialization is wrong um, or that, but you could, but you could also do it. And I think all of these approaches have long histories in the Taoist tradition. Um, and it's just where you, I think it's a question of one's own um, kind of just disposition uh, and also one's motivation. Uh, the disposition and the motivation just leads to these different combinations and pure permutations of inward or outward orientation of uh, more commercial orientation or totally like image non you know even anti-materialist kind of um, orientation yeah that's a wonderful answer thank you i, I appreciate that that was very enlightening um so we will just talk about this briefly because i'm hoping that we're going to have another interview after this with you and your colleagues but could you talk to us a little bit about the yao dao project that you're involved in right now yeah, so basically, um, so we've talked about two of my main projects and, and books that came out of it. One was on the Qigong movement in China, then the Dream Trippers, that is really about the spread outside of China. But these two are, are um, these two studies, in a sense, are both about how people in very modern societies in China and the West uh, practice these um body-centered practices of qigong and meditation and so on really centered around the individual the the body and the energy we could say of the individual but a really really important part of taoism is actually taoist ritual uh and in the field of taoist studies that's really where it's at where that's what matters and for and also from an anthropological perspective i mean the study of ritual is like at the core of the study of anthropology right and Taoism has just such an unbelievably rich ritual tradition. And my teachers in Taoist studies, Shipper uh, and John Lagerway and Ken Dean, I mean, they they really they really were giants in the field of establishing this field of study of Taoist ritual. So I always felt that I kind of need to know something about this, and I'm just fascinated by it. And so I did one study in northern Guangdong province on a ritual tradition. And actually, I have a book coming out in Chinese, um, uh, maybe this year or next year on it. But really, that was a prelude to a great project that has emerged, uh, which is looking at the Taoist ritual tradition of the Lantan Yao ethnic minority in northern Laos. So uh, really at the Golden Triangle region, that is on the boundary between China, Laos, Myanmar, and Thailand. So that region, which in the past was known as the, you know, the, the in a sense, the, the vortex of the opium, right. <laughs> you know, but actually that's the place where one of, there are many, many uh, ethnic groups that live in those mountains in that region. And one of them is the Yao people. And the Yao also exists in China and in Vietnam uh, and a little bit in, uh, Thailand, um, they are well known for being Taoist in a very particular way. 
that all men as the rite of passage into manhood, so from youth to manhood, at the age of around 16 or so, you have to undergo ordination as a Taoist master. And so you have to be trained in Taoist ritual, Taoist magic, Taoist uh, scripture, uh, writing, and so on. An unbelievably um, complex training is required of all young men in the community. And this tradition, um, to some degrees, it exists in uh, Yao communities in China. Um, but it hadn't really been studied anthropologically in a very systematic way. And it's fascinating to scholars because the celestial masters uh, movement of Taoism in the Han dynasty, basically around 200 AD, which is when the first organized Taoist movement emerged in China, it followed the same structure where the entire community, everybody would be ordained uh, as a Taoist priest. Um, so it's, so anyway, this exists. And, and, and so there's a community in Laos that still lives like that. Um, and it has been cut off from China for about a hundred years. Um, and so what's amazing is that they don't speak Chinese. They speak Yao and Lao, but actually they still have to copy the, scriptures in the ritual texts the manuscripts they have to copy them in chinese and they actually know not only they copy them in chinese but they know they actually know the meaning of it uh they know how to pronounce it and they know the meaning of it and the 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 rituals themselves are of unbelievable complexity um it is just mind-boggling the level of you know this is a semi-nomadic um, slash and burn um, culture that lived in the hills and would move around. Now they're sedentary, but they, you know, for centuries, they would, they would just move around every, um, about every 12 years or so from one place to another, cut the trees, burn it, and then grow rice uh, and things like that. Um, so, uh, uh, it's a highly egalit uh, somewhat egalitarian, uh, loosely organized type of society, unlike the highly, um, highly hierarchical, feudalistic Chinese society. Um, and yet in that loose organization, they just have such an unbelievably complex uh, ritual tradition, which is really that keeps the entire community, which is really the mode of organization of the community. Um, the levels of um, the there are visualizations that take place pl take place during the ritual that are like movies, um, and they, in a sense, they when you realize what's going on, it also collapses the distinction that we see in now modern conceptions of Taoism, where those the meditation is on one side and the ritual, you know, is on the other, right? right. But actually, here you have it; it's completely uh, integrated. Um, the level of magic, um, and in a sense, the theories of magic that uh, underlie a lot of what's going on. So in a sense, we have a, a tradition here that is uh, perhaps richer than any other um, Taoist tradition that has been studied anthropologically. Now, the reason um, it was uh, by serendipity that I ended up uh, engaged in this research, um, an anthropologist, uh, Josiba Estevez, um, uh, uh, who had been he was studying at University of Münster in Germany. He was um, doing his PhD in the anthropology of Southeast Asia. And so his field site, he had found this community of the Yao uh, as his field site. And he spent several years there um, uh, and learning their language, living like an anthropologist among this community, getting to know them very, very well, learning their ritual practices. But he was trained in Southeast Asian studies, not in Taoist studies. And then he realized that this is so Taoist and also so Chinese that he, he needed a collaborator to kind of plug him into the world of Taoist studies. So he came to Hong Kong and we met and we started a collaboration. And so, um, uh, and now I have a wonderful team, not only him, but because the work also involved scanning thousands of manuscripts. And so I have PhD 
Um, I have a, a PhD students who have been working on um, understanding these uh, manuscripts. Um, and um, so all this is an ongoing project that's taking uh, many years. Um, and um, it's very fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, that's extremely exciting. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can get you and the rest of the team together um, shortly in the future so that we can learn more about it, because I know that I want to learn more about it. And I think our audience will, too. Sure. Yeah, I'll be happy to try to set that up. That would be fantastic. Well, David, uh, Professor Palmer, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I we'll hope to talk to you again soon. Mm -hmm.